Please listen carefully, for this is the word of God. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. This is the word of God. This is part four um, of our opening year series where we refresh our vision. And today I want to take a second look at this passage, Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. Last week I talked about the new wine, the gospel, how the gospel brings joy, freedom, and a newness, a newness of who we are um, through the grace that we receive through Jesus. And today I want to talk about um, what it means to do that together as a community. That the new wine actually needs a container. <laughs> you know, the, if we're going to drink new wine, it, it, the way Jesus puts it is it has to go into something. <laughs> and back then they didn't have nice, you know, and today we have plastic, <laughs> right? And, but, that, you know, and we, of course we put wine in, into nice, you know, wine, you know, wine, uh, wine bottles, but back then they put it into these skins. And if you put the new wine into an old wine skin, I mean, I, I don't know this, I've never seen this for myself, all right? But apparently, old wine skin, um, it will start to tear and it'll break apart. And, um, and so what does it mean that for us to drink of the new wine of the gospel of Christ that we need to have a, a, a community, and we're talking here about the church and its community, and the kind of community that we need to be and to become um, in order so that the wine isn't just spilled out and dissipating all over the place, but that it could regularly be contained in this community and, um, and then offered, offered up to people who are very, very thirsty and tired of the old wine, okay? So that's what we're talking about today, new wineskin community in three parts. Part one, religion and the poison of Pharisaic pride. What I really want to do is I want to kind of like tighten up and emphasize what I covered some of last week. What makes the old wine the old wine? <laughs> the oldness, right? Religion and the poison of Pharisaic pride. And then part two, let's talk about um, the newness. The new wineskin of great expectations and cost. That's the way I want to put it. The new wineskin of great expectations and cost. And then part three, the crossed and, and humble love through hope. Right? The cross and humble love through hope. That's the power that will give us, enable us to be this new wineskin. The cross and the humble love through hope. Right? Um, you know, this passage, it, it's, there's a conflict going on here. Because they ask Jesus this question. Why, why don't your guys fast? The Pharisees, their disciples fast. John the Baptist, those guys fast. But yours don't. And then Jesus says this remarkable thing, and, and, and I kind of went to this complex piece of theology last week, where he's basically saying, I'm the bridegroom. <laughs> How can anybody, and you know, the Jews, they all get, it's like, a, the bridegroom is the star. I mean, today in, in, in our kind of present day weddings, we tend to think of the bride as the star uh, of, of the wedding. But um, in Jewish weddings, the bridegroom, when he arrives, the, the wedding feast can really begin. <laughs> 
and they realize, and they feast for days. <laughs> that there, there's, this, uh, there's a famous miracle that's given in the Gospel of John, and they run out of wine. <laughs> it's actually, it's a disaster. It's a crazy disaster. So Jesus is saying, hey, of course they're going to eat and drink because I'm here. <laughs> it's an incredible thing that he's saying. And um, an extraordinary, it's, about as, it's about almost as explicit as, as a way that he could say, I'm the Messiah. The one, the bridegroom that all of the God's people is waiting for. Right? And then, but, but this is, what makes this new wine? He says, when I come, we can drink. And the newness comes, so we can do new things. <laughs> and, I, and I said to you last week, um, there, is, there is a new wine that we drink. And it brings, you can see it all in this passage, there's joy. There's a freedom. There's a freedom from the old righteousness. A freedom from the old rule keeping. If I, if I have these rules and if I have the right beliefs, I'm right. <laughs> And so, and then, then I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting closer and I'm going to like reach up to make my way up to God. That's, that's the spirit. And what there is Jesus is saying, and what, this is the thing that's so remarkable and so weird about the gospel. It is completely the total normal default mode of the human mind. If we're going to get up to God, we have to get up there and climb up there and reach up. And there's things that we're going to do. If we do this, then we're right. <laughs> this is making us the better kind of people. And, um, you know, I, I said to you last week, um, people do this. And, you know, some of it does make us better people. <laughs> I mean, fasting is not a bad practice. It does I mean, I try to offer this to you. What, what, what is the fundamental core spiritual wisdom of fasting is that we usually turn to food to make ourselves happy when we're feeling low. But we go without something in the world that we usually turn to to fill ourselves is to say, I'm low and I'm weak. You, you're, 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 you're confronting your weakness and you're saying, I'm going to hunger for something better than food for God himself. Now, but here's a twist. <laughs> here's a twist. Two people can be in this, in the, and they can both fast. Or they can do, practice some piece of religion. One does it because they're saying, I'm weak and I'm hungry and I need you by your love and your grace to come fill me. That's real faith. That's gospel faith. That's all the movement toward allowing God to come to us. You no. Know, can any of you go up and reach God and make him come down? Can you and I do that? <laughs> and yet, that's the fundamental blindness of Phariseeism. Phariseeism is this, if I do this practice, somehow God, I'm like, I'm doing the right thing, and I pre pre perform this right work, and I have the right position, and I'm doing the right thing, and now God's going to owe me, and, he, and now he's going to kind of come down to me or somehow. But that's a delusion, <laughs> The only approach, real approach to God is first to admit, all I got is the old wine. <laughs> all I got is a very, very bad wineskin. <laughs> so if you can't admit this first, see, new wine can't get into, new wine must go into a new wineskin. You know what the wineskin is? It's us. The container is yourself. It's your very life. <laughs> and so, you and I have to become a new container. You have to become a new kind of wineskin. But nobody can make that happen. But some people think they can like, earn it and make it happen if they do things like fasting. So you, you have two people in the same, let's say, let's say two people fast. One of them, they do it by saying, I'm going to reach up and like, by doing these works, I'm going to turn myself into a new kind of wineskin. And then like, God has to give me his like, good stuff. <laughs> He's going to come down and give me his good stuff. That's the pharisaical spirit. But the true gospel spirit is actually, it's, it's a brokenness. Let the old wine skin die and go away. That's why, you know, the, 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 the more like, you know, famous phrase that even, even the non-Christians in our society know of, this new wine and new wine skin. Old wine, old wine skin. The more famous phrase is to be born again. You guys heard this? 
That's why some people say, are you a born again Christian? Um, so, you, know, you know what that just really means? It just means, are you really a real Christian? <laughs> That's all it really means. Because your old self died. <laughs> and a new self was given to you. <laughs> a new self was born in you, given to you, not by something we can earn, but the Holy Spirit came and see, the Holy Spirit is the, the new wine. <laughs> now this is the strange thing. You can have the person in the room, one guy is like saying, I'm going to reach up. That's Phariseeism. What does the person who does the right thing, this is the person who does the right thing, okay? The right religious practice. Well, how does he look upon the person who's not doing them? You guys all know what it's like. Mm -mm, it looks like this, right? You're, you're down there. You're down there. I'm up here. You're down there. You know, if we could go back, I wish we could have like a little movie and everybody could go back and we could have a movie and meet the Pharisees that Jesus is encountering. You know what we would probably do? We'd probably like them. They're the ones who are doing the right thing. A lot of us would like them. They're the ones who are doing the right thing. You want to hang out with the lepers? Oh, yeah, it's so nice. Jesus is a great, loving person. He, he likes to eat with lepers and hang out with prostitutes. Do you hang out with prostitutes? <laughs> Do you want to have lepers over your house? People's skin is rotten off. They're like, they're, they're literally diseased and corrupt. It's, it's a, it's a, that's those, those are the people I want to hang out, have over at my house. Huh? Of course not. That's, that, that's, the point is, Jesus himself is like the newness. And he came into, and he, he walked right into the oldness. And says, you're of the oldness. Want to have dinner with me? Jesus is the new wine. Breaking in. Now, um, I, I, um, I told you a funny, strange thing. That here is the spirit. I'm of the right, and you're not. We have a word for this. It's pride. Oh, pride. It's, it's, it's this focus on like the self being right. You know, the, the pride is kind of like, there's, a, there's kind of a funny way of uh, it's expressed. One is um, the I'm so great because I'm right. <laughs> That's the more typical way we tend to think of it. But you know that pride also have that I'm so bad because I got to make myself right. You know that? Insecurity is actually just the down, it's like the flip side of pride. Pride has to have both sides. You know that? It's the, when you're doing, when you're doing it right, <laughs> mm, that side. But then when you're not doing it right, oh, oh, it's about me, oh, oh like it's, it's looking toward you, oh, that's pride too. <laughs> but Phariseeism is usually on the, the side. You guys like that? You know what? It's in the church all the time. It's in the church all the time. Whenever people see what the right thing is and then they go embrace it without God, without grace, there's always going to be that. And I share with you this uh, a remarkable um, book, a little piece out of this book last week. Um, Openness Unhindered, Further Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert by Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Um, she was, a, she was a, a lesbian activist, English professor at Syracuse University. And she decided to do um, research on the Bible so she could understand her enemies. In other words, she's like, those religious Pharisees who are always telling us we're bad because they're right. Is she right to think that there are these people who are Christians who are Pharisaical, you know, these, and their righteousness is like this poisoned righteousness, right? Because they do the right things. She's right. Absolutely right. She talked about how she got hate mail from Christians. How, how, what I want to say is she got hate mail from Pharisees. That's what you got. A real Christian wouldn't do that. Why? Because how can you 
just hate somebody else because they're a sinner. <laughs> when the only way we get to come to Jesus is as a broken down sinner. See? And those two spirits are very different. But here's how she, I, I shared this portion with you last week, and I want to emphasize this again this week. She was wrestling with this question. She started going to church, she started reading the Bible, and it started like she could feel Jesus knocking on the door of her heart. And it's like, what if this is true? What if it's true? That's what she said to her, her lesbian lover. What if it's true? And she went to church, and she was confronted with Romans chapter 1 where it's very explicit that homosexuality is sin. But it's very interesting to her. It wasn't exactly what she thought. It was this. Here's how she put it. All right? The image of me and everyone I love suffering in hell crashed over me like shark-infested waves of a raging sea. Suffering in hell not because we were gay, but because we were proud. We wanted to be autonomous. In other words, I can define this on my own. No God. Autonomy, we can decide what is right and wrong for ourselves. And we choose to be gay. We choose it. But she actually realized it wasn't the gayness. It was actually, we wanted to be autonomous. We were proud. It was our hearts first. And our bodies followed. I got it. I heard it. And then she started realizing, how do you repent of something that doesn't even feel bad to you? And so she started praying the way her friend, Ken Floyd, Ken and Floyd Smith, Ken and Floyd Smith, is a pastor. And he didn't try to treat her like a project to fix her or convert her. What he did was he... He offered friendship <laughs> with a strange kind of like confident humility. See, not with a, I'm right and you're wrong. Your real problem is you're gay. <laughs> Isn't that what we, well, so many of us Christians do? If you ever meet somebody who's gay, the immediately thing is you just think of them as gay. <laughs> Instead of thinking of them as human. It's like, Okay, that, that's something we disagree on. I'm right about that, and you're wrong. <laughs> you, you get that, that, that there's a pharisaical spirit there? You look at the person first as gay, and then, and then you don't even think of them as human. That's, that's especially bad. But how about if we first see them as human <laughs> and broken and sinful? Oh, like me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Human beings are made in the image of God, and because of that, do you realize there's always good? I mean, a person has to become so demonically prideful, and the more prideful we're becoming, by the way, is you're becoming more like Satan. Not like God. But even people who are far from God, or who don't believe in Jesus, you know, they still have the image of God in them. And we can be friends with them. And you can love them. And guess what? Maybe there are aspects of the image of God that's stronger than you and me. And in fact, not maybe, there will be. You ever hung out with um, some non-Christians and, um, and you're hanging out with them and you realize they're actually smarter than you. <laughs> or they're actually kinder than you. Or are they actually more generous than you? There's an area of their life you're like, okay, this part of your life, I don't agree with, and I don't do those things. But in this part of your life, wow, I don't do those things that you do, and you're better than me. If we're really honest, that's real. And if we can be that way, now we're starting to be more human. And you offer them real French. That's what Ken and Floyd did. And so she started reading the Bible with them. Just think about it. What, what, she's like a radical lesbian activist. She helped build the whole movement. 
how crazy is it to go over to a pastor's house and read the Bible with him because she wants to, because he's a friend. He dropped his Phariseeism, and what he said was, you know what he offered her? It's like, I'm trying to be a new wineskin and offer you new wine. And she received it. And then she wanted to repent. And you know, she realized she, she, she's had this moment. She started praying, Lord, help me with this. And then she said she saw it. Pride. She saw, like, her, she looked at her room and there was, she saw pride all over the place. That was literally the word. It was gay pride. Symbols of pride all over the place. And she just learned that it wasn't her sexuality that was primarily going to be the one that was separating her from God. It was her pride. See? She, she came up with the secular religion of autonomy. Not sexuality. It was her autonomous religion. And by the way, um, I know lots of heterosexual people who believe in that religion of me. You can't tell me what to do. How, how dare all these other people? See, like, the reason, what we got in, in America right now is a war of Phariseeism. We got the religious people. And then we have the secular Pharisaical religion. And they're at war with each other with their pride. I'm right and you're wrong. I'm right and good. You're wrong and bad. That's what's going on in America right now. It's just kind of like a clash of two old wineskins. That's what's going on. What we need is a lot more Ken and Floyd Smiths who are like new wineskins. And, and the only way you can get to that is through the gospel. And the gospel does something very, very strange. It lets you be humble. It gives us humility. Why? Because in order to get there, you must first admit, I can't make it to God. And then when you make that admission, you find out that somebody else came to you and forgave you, washed you, renewed you. He brought you to God, not I made it up to God because I was right, but I was so, so wrong, <laughs> including when I was right. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's weird. I was right, <laughs> but filled with my pride. That's exactly where I was wrong. So even the, there's Christians, supposedly, who are always having to repent. And so humility but usually when most of us are humble, we're humble because we have to admit we're wrong. Is that when we're like the most humble? Okay, I wasn't good enough. Oh, you're better than me. That's, so we, we hate admitting that. <laughs> and so usually it puts us into this kind of like low place. But here's the funny thing. What the gospel can offer you is humility and confidence. Isn't that weird? Usually when we're humble, we're like oh, lacking confidence. But you can also be confident. Why? Because somebody else made our place before God absolutely secure. And through that, you know you're utterly loved. That's the gospel. It's a crazy, weird combination. Both confident and humble. But you see, if you're only drinking the old wine, if you meet a Christian, he has total confidence. We're Christians. We're right. But no humility? That's Phariseeism. If you sometimes meet a person and they're utterly just broken down, at least they're being honest with themselves. You can be both Christians and non-Christians. You know, like, a, you know, a lot of us are of Korean descent. In, in, in Korea, they drink a lot, especially the men. You know why they drink? Because if you're a Korean man, you're supposed to be strong. <laughs> but you're super stressed out, and deep down you know you're not strong. And now you can't make it. So you know how they finally allow themselves to be, to be honest? Go into a place of humility? They drink. <laughs> it's like you get like smashing drunk, and then you get permission to say, whatever I say here is because I'm drunk, right? <laughs> now let me tell you 
Oh, my wife hates me because I'm such a coward. Oh, <laughs> and you can finally tell that to your friend because you're drunk. They need the old, literally they need a wine <laughs> to put themselves into the honest place of humility. And then, and then the next day they're like, okay, look, hang over, get over this thing. Back to pride. <laughs> Cover myself in pride. It's an old strategy. Every culture has their way of doing that, including ours. Hmm. And so humility, but without confidence. Got to drink and make yourself drunk to make it. But then in Christ, humble yet confident. Hmm. Enough to even go to people that that may disagree with you. In fact, maybe you may, they may even like be fear you or hate you and offer them friendship <laughs> out of confident humility. So that's the newness. Now let's go to part two. The wineskin of great expectations and costs. Now, I just kind of gave you a quick recap of like how newness looks. You know, we're like, where we cast off pharisaical pride. What does it look like inside of a community? <laughs> Imagine, you know, if you ever meet one person who's like this, a Ken Smith, a Floyd Smith. Isn't it great? <laughs> Isn't it great to meet somebody who has a kind of confidence, but they, but they never stick it over you? <laughs> They're utterly, like, humble to you and treat you with real, and, you, and you're safe before them. They're vulnerable to you. You can be vulnerable to them. And you can be real with each other. Nobody's trying to like make the other person into a project. Isn't that incredible? Now let's just stop for a moment. What if there was a community of people and they all did that for each other? What if you didn't just meet one person? Or, you know, if you have one person in your life that's like that, isn't that great? <laughs> There's not a lot of people like that. But... It, what if you went into a community and they, you know, and, and if you, even if we're like, if let's, you know, you and I as Christians, you, we have confident humility to offer genuine friendship and love to somebody else. We could do it for like two hours and then the next two hours we go like <laughs> pharisaical pride. Or we do it for two days and then for the next week we go back to fairs and then we have to like break that up again. But even if you can have one or two friends, like, isn't that great? Or we can even be like that some of the time. But what if you got, went into a community and they were committed that constantly will repent of Phariseeism and of pride? And we will go and to Jesus in weakness and lowliness and allow his new wine to make us confident. Not in ourselves, but in him. A whole community was committed to that. And then, you know what we'll do? We'll offer that wonderful friendship of joy, freedom, newness to each other. We'll offer that vulnerable yet confident friendship to each other. What, what, if, we, what if we did that? And if we did that, what we'd get is then, then you didn't just have one person in your life. You'd have two and then, th you, so you go into, you know, in our, in our church, we, we call them GLFs, Gospel Life Families. You know, we're, what we're actually asking you to do, we're actually asking you to practice, because we all are not good at it. We're asking you to practice vulnerable, confident humility and genuine love and friendship toward each other. That's what we're asking you to do. And in that container, that container is a new culture that we're forming. And that's, that's our community. We call it Gospel Life Family. In fact, our whole church, we want to be one big Gospel Life Family. You know what the Gospel Life Family is? That's just our word for a new wineskin. That's all we're talking about. And what if Instead of just knowing one or two people in your life like that, you knew three, five, ten, fifteen. Okay, none of them did it perfectly. <laughs> but when they would fail, and every now and then their little Phariseeisms would pop out, we'd go, mm. 
Other people, including your own, would come out. Or sometimes your old selves, your sinfulness would come out. Instead of them condemning you, they would do exactly what Jesus did for prostitutes. Exactly what Jesus did for lepers. He would love us. would be loved. And His humility, His kindness would confront us in a gentle but disarming way. What if we all did this? That's a new wineskin. Now I want to say a couple things about this. Um, I want to say a few about having this kind of, first we're like, wow, that'd be so wonderful. Okay, then we go into the reality of it. It's like, it's like the new wineskin is like always imperfect. I want to say a few um, points about this. Num number one, um, when we go and build a new wineskin, almost always inside the church, there's people who don't get it. <laughs> they just don't get it. That was, they're trying to bring, drink the old wineskin. Let's go follow the rules, and then let's try harder on the rules. And if you not try harder on the rules and the right things to do, then, so like that's one. And then they're trying to hold to the old trappings of the way we do church. There are some people, they just can't see the newness of the gospel. It's, it's weird. You can tell them the gospel on again, again, again. They just see that as part of the religion. <laughs> the, the word G-O-S-P-E-L. Literally, Jesus redeemed you by grace. It's such an old, I heard this since I was five years old. Okay, it's just still part of the religion. It's like part of the furniture. It's like we have to have a cross and we have to have hymn books and all this other stuff. It's just all just part of the trappings. And they don't get it that even the very words of the gospel, they just kind of like, uh, they've made it part of old wine. And so then, get, you know what? Uh, if you're going to be a new wineskin church, you have to change. Because you know why? Because unbeliefs inside the culture, it's a moving target. One generation doesn't have the same kind of unbeliefs, or the same kind of resistance to God. They, they, it shifts. We all have the same pride resistance, but then we change our reasoning and our, change our thinking. Each generation goes, oh, they're, you know, they have different ways. And so guess what? The church has to renew and adapt to offer newness of wine again and again. And that means, so people who constantly want it to, to be done the old way, <laughs> that's a pharisaical spirit too. You know, we have, you, have, you have churches, less so now, but there were like maybe 20 years ago. Um, churches would say, if you don't have hymns, then you're not a good church. Hey, you have drums. <laughs> you have drums. Oh, the drums, that's the music of the devil. <laughs> you can't use that. You can't use that. Worldly people use that. <laughs> um, nowadays, I guess some people would be like, if you walk into church and you had a tattoo or something. I mean, like what? I mean, so many people are tatted today, right? But why well, you can't be tatted and be a Christian? <laughs> so that's there's a kind that there's a resistance to change. <laughs> and that's so that's one comment: a resistance to change, newness actually needs literally newness. We actually have to new, try new things. And guess what? Nobody knows exactly what those new things are. But you know what we're doing? It's the spirit to offer the gospel again to today's resistance and unbelief. You know, like the, the, we all, this is really strange. I grew up um, in, that, in that twilight between old like hymns and contemporary Christian music. Do you know that the music I can consider contemporary Christian music is now considered old by the generation today? So if we sang those songs today, they would go like, what is this? And then I'm like, but these are the good songs. <laughs> My generation like, but these are the really good songs. And then the young kids are like, the younger people are like, whatever. And if I'm unwilling to let go of the ones that I consider the good songs because they were the good songs for me, guess what? I'm just back to staying in the old. So that's one comment I'd like to make. We're going to be a new wineskin people. Can't be afraid of the new. I want to say something about this. Um, there's a difference between traditional and traditionalism. Traditional and traditionalism. 
There are some churches today that I think are kind of annoying. They're always trying to be hip and new. Hip and new. We're going to be hip and new. I'm like, you know, that's just kind of shallow, actually. Because our culture is always kind of geared toward the new. So there are, the reason some things become traditional is because usually there's some kind of wisdom and power in it. So I consider myself a person that likes to draw from the wise traditional, but I'm not a traditionalist. You know what a traditionalist is? A traditionalism is a person who believes in the tradition. <laughs> I don't believe in the tradition. I believe in Jesus, a new wine. Any and all tradition, I can chuck. Because no tradition saved me. <laughs> but if it's good and useful to help us move toward Jesus, let's do it. <laughs> we can hold it. But if it's not working anymore, let's make it new. <laughs> let's get rid of it. <laughs> and yet, constantly in the church, you get this battle. Traditionalist. Which is a kind of Phariseeism. Let me offer a different way. All right. Another thing that um, the new wineskin folks do is there's two things I want to talk about. Is one is we have great expectations. <laughs> the new wineskin of great expectations. You know why? You look at you meet somebody. They walk into the church and they get rings in their noses, and you know you're like, oh, this person has sexuality is a little not biblical. Let's put it that way. So we're like. What are they doing in church? If you say that, that's pharisaical. If you're like, look, a lesbian woman came into our church. Maybe she'll meet God. Great expectations. Hear what I'm saying? You get excited. And then here's where it gets even more interesting. You go to work. You meet a person who's Buddhist. Grew, you know, they're from like Vietnam. And they consider themselves Buddhist. And then the other, then the other cubicle, you know, you, 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 make, you meet your, your friend who's from like Midwest. And they're gay. And you know what you think? Maybe if they met Jesus. They would desire new wine. Hmm. Not if they met religion, but if they met Jesus. Our Jesus, this Jesus. Hmm. Great expectations. And along with great expectations, you know, we have to take a risk. There's a cost. So you make friendships and you love people, including each other. And sometimes, guess what? They disappoint us. They hurt us. Or they're just blind. They don't get it. Heck, the Christians don't even get it. <laughs> Sometimes you're in the church. You're in GLF and you go through a season of like our, our small group and like, like people just don't, they just have the wrong spirit. They don't like, ah, I don't know. Those last five sermons that pastors on gay, they were like, whatever. <laughs> it's like, whatever. Heck, maybe it's you. Okay, like, I don't even always like my own sermons. I listen, I listen to some, I'm like, oh, this one is kind of a dud. <laughs> I'm not going to grow too much from this one. <laughs> and we go through that. that that's the Christians. <laughs> and so, what is the cost? To continue to believe and have hope, even when they're stubborn, when we're stubborn, but here's the thing. When the new wine of Jesus is encountered, oh, we have expectation. By grace, new and beautiful things happen. And we keep up with that. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes it's tiring to keep offering this. Many of you serve mightily in the church. Do you ever get tired? You ever get tired? I get tired. You're like, well, you get paid for it. Well, that doesn't mean I don't get tired. <laughs> That's why pastors need this thing called sabbatical. <laughs> it's like so they can just like... There are pastors I know, they work really hard, and after six years or whatever, then the church gives them like a six-month sabbatical. And then you know what happens after that? Then they quit ministry. 
I'm like, oh, wow, that's bad. You're supposed to get the sabbatical so that you can be refreshed, then you go back into it. And then they're like, okay, I quit. <laughs> I've met, I can't even tell you how many pastors I've met that that, that happens. So don't worry, guys. If I go into sabbatical, I'm not, I'm not, I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, is he going to quit? Well, okay, don't worry. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, um, but, but that happens. And let's go to this final part. How do we keep offering? Keep having the great expectations. We get, it's, tired, it's hard to have like a great expectation. Jesus could change this person. And then it doesn't happen. Oh, oh Jesus could change this person. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to love this person. And then, and then they disappoint me. So you do this to the Christian. Oh, this person's not changing. <laughs> you offer this to the non-Christian. Oh, this person's not changing. And then you keep loving. And then we get weary. And then you sometimes they hurt you. And then, and then we love them. Or actually, we're not really loving them. We're just kind of dutifully doing the right thing. <laughs> we're like, oh, I'll serve. I'll serve. I'll serve. But we're running on empty. We actually stop having expectation that they'll change and receive the newness of Jesus and have his joy and his freedom again. We, our expectations are getting low, low, low. <laughs> and we get weary. And instead of walking to church, I'm going to worship Jesus. <laughs> I might grow and change. My brothers and sisters are going to grow and change. We're going to love more. Who knows who's going to show up in church today? Instead of that, we're like, uh, yeah, church, okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'll skip the first couple songs, show up late. Yeah, I'll get the message. I'll try to tune out till Pastor Susan gets to the good part. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait. So today's the first Sunday. Oh, we're going to have Lord's Supper. Okay, that, that's good. That'll be good. Am I making this up? I'm the pastor, and I know this feeling. The only thing I know that you, know, you, you feel this way. And how do we go back to being a new wine? So like, that's like us slipping into the old wine skin. And how do we go back? We go back to the cross. That's how we go back. We go back to the cross. Not the Jesus that's all up there, but the Jesus who came down here. The Jesus who came down here. You know, the Jesus up, you know, most of us probably think of the Jesus way up there. He's like high and mighty and like he's so holy and I'm like down here. And like I'm here I am again with very little love and low expectations, uh, grinding it out, trying to like tough it out with my dutiful obedience, which is not really new wine obedience, but it's a pharisaical, just kind of like discipline. Uh, huh, right? We go back, but if we go back to Jesus, you know what the cross is? It's the God who came down. You know what the cross is? It's the God who's walking and eating with us, the stubborn ones, the blind ones, the ones who don't change, eating with the Pharisees like us, bearing up the sins of the broken, stubborn Pharisees like us. That's the cross. And we go back to that, Jesus. <laughs> And then, you know what we remember? You know what? He reached me. <laughs> he renewed me. That means he can renew them. <laughs> he will renew them. <laughs> and what that does is it opens up hope. <laughs> we go back to the place where we're broken. And that's cross reached us. 
and His blood covered over. I love, this is one of my favorite verses in the Old Bible, 1 Peter 4, 8. Keep, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Why? Here's the part I love. Since love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> That's how Jesus reached us. He kept loving us earnestly. His love covered over his sin, but we know what we're talking about, his blood. <laughs> and so we go out there and like it feels like we're shedding blood for other people. But we have the hope, we can have the hope again of doing so. We remember how he did it for us. And then when we keep picking ourselves, picking each other, you, you, you get to the place, look, it's always going to be like this in church. You'll be in a place where you're like, Jesus has filled me. And then you're going to turn to a brother, and they're broken low. And then we, our love for them, which we receive from Jesus, covers over their weariness and their sins. And then they can feel something of Christ's love again and reminded of the cross again. And then they're up. And then, guess what? Six months later, you're the one who's down. <laughs> Last night we had a little taste of that in our night of worship. In a whole room, we went back to that place of the cross. That hope. And hope can rise again. And this is our church. If we do not forget, forget, I mean, give up, then keep doing this. And we keep following this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers the multitudes and allow the hope. Then, and we keep offering this. We keep offering this to each other and then we offer this to our neighbors. You know what we're doing? This is the new wineskin. And Jesus, you believe this. And his spirit will be poured out. And we'll see newness again and again and again. It can't be stopped. Repentance is our power. Confident humility is our power. Grace, which we received, the grace that we give. The grace which receives gives us the hope to give love and grace yet again. <laughs> this is our power. Let's be this new wineskin and watch God do incredible things. Let's pray.